Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I want to, before I get into everything, I just want to take an opportunity to thank you all sincerely on behalf of the defense team because of the week we were dark with illnesses and you've all been so patient and so attentive and so willing to stick with us. We're all, both sides, extremely appreciative of that, so thank you for that. This case boils down to a very simple question. Why did Gareth Purse House go to 2086 Mount Street on February 14, 2020? Already technical problem. I have so much I need to say. The answer is clear. He went there because he was desperate to talk to Amy Harwick. Why did he need to speak to her so desperately? Well, you've heard a lot of evidence in this case. Uh, you've had a chance to see Amy Harwick's email to herself describing her encounter with Mr. Pursehouse at the Expos Awards. You've had an opportunity to hear from many witnesses who Amy told about the encounter and included details she hadn't included in her email. You had an opportunity to see Gareth Pursehouse's text messages to Amy Harwick. All of this paints an undeniable picture of the extreme pain Mr. Pursehouse, Gareth Pursehouse, was experiencing after his breakup with Amy Harwick back in 2012. And he struggled in all those intervening years to deal with the daily pain that he described to her in those text messages. It was a struggle he tried to control. He made efforts to get his equilibrium, and he managed to. He dated other women. He was successful in his career. And he had a life, a good life. He had no shortage of uh, romance in his life but it fell short in his estimation. It was nothing compared to the relationship he had with Amy Harwick. And he described it to her. He said that he shared everything with her during their relationship. And they forged a deep intimacy, one that he couldn't replicate with anybody else. So when Amy Harwick walked into the ex -Biz Awards, on that fateful day in January, and he saw her for the first time in all those years after the restraining order had expired years previously. And through no fault of his own, there she was. It landed like a sucker punch on him. And it literally brought him to his knees. He curled up in the fetal position in this crowded red carpet area in front of peers, coworkers, strangers. It was something he could not control. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something we cannot deny. All of the evidence in this case undeniably establishes that Gareth Pursehouse was suffering a great emotional upheaval, one that interfered with his thought process, one that focused him like a laser on getting relief from this unrelenting pain. And the only person he thought could help him, that could release him, was Amy Harwick. And why is that? Because when he saw her, and she spoke to him, it was cathartic. He was able to let that facade open. He, the emotions he'd repressed for so long surfaced, and he cried, and he cried some more. He was shaking. I mean, the, the descriptions 
that we've gotten from Amy Harwick and her friends establish a man in a crisis. The prosecution claims he was trying to force his way back into her life, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He was trying to cope with the fallout of Amy Harwick walking back into his life. He didn't ask for that. It was a chance encounter, and it left him reeling without a lifeline. The evidence in this case shows both an internal dialogue Mr. Pursehouse was going through, as well as how he externally presented to other people as a result of the manifestation of his emotional crisis. So I'm gonna to wanna to go through some of the evidence in this case that, that shows the state of mind Mr. Pursehouse was in. But before we get to that, I want to talk about this jury instruction. This is CalCrim 303. And this is very important because you've received a lot of state of mind evidence in this case. And it's very important you understand the limitations to the state of mind of Amy Harwick because that evidence is only admitted for a limited purpose. So let me be clear on what that purpose is by first going through the instruction with you. During the trial, evidence of Amy Harwick's email to herself and statements to friends related to her fear of the defendant Gareth Pursehouse are being admitted for a limited purpose, to show her then state of mind that she was in fear of the defendant, that she would not have consented to him entering her home, and would not have consented to him lying in wait. You may not consider this evidence for, you, you may consider th that evidence only for that purpose and for no other. So you cannot use this evidence in any way to decide whether or not Gareth Pursehouse intended her harm. All of her statements about her fear, how he might, in her mind, have intended her harm, those are not something you can consider in assessing Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind or his intentions. That being said, let's move on to Amy Harwick's email to herself. It might be a little hard to read, but I'm gonna highlight certain parts of this. She describes, you know, the first encounter, how Gareth came up behind her and started screaming. And then she describes how he started looking like he was going to cry. And he was breathing heavily and flailing his arms around. And she also makes a point of, um, well, yeah, that he's dysregulated in his eyes. That part is not highlighted. So she's describing a person whose emotions are taking over their physical body. He was sobbing. His head, his head was in his hands. He couldn't sit up straight. His head was in his hands. He was hyperventilating. He was distorting his face up and shaking violently. He was sh shaking so hard, he couldn't control it because of his emotions. He told me that he thinks about me every day, and every day he cries. He told me he lost his job when we broke up because he couldn't work. He told me that no matter what, no matter what he did, he couldn't stop obsessing over me. He told me that I was a cheater and a liar because he thought we were still together when I believed we were broken up. So, Mr. Pursehouse also felt there had been, um, you know, that Amy had cheated on him during the course of their relationship. Um, and that was, you know, back when they were together. And he recited text messages that she had sent from that time frame, back when they were together. About nine years ago, he recited the date, who they were to, and exactly what was said word for word. He said he wasn't able to move on, but he's dated, but nobody with me. He said he thinks about me constantly, and he can't watch the TV shows that we watch together, hear the songs that we liked, or the names that we called each other, 
or even smell vanilla, or he has a panic attack. And all of that was before Amy Harwick walked back in, in his life. He's describing what his day-to-day -day life was like before that encounter at the ex -Biz Awards. Imagine what it must be like to go through your day-to-day -day activities carrying the burden of those emotions. Imagine how exhausting that must have been. Imagine how hard Mr. Pursehouse would have had to work to maintain the life he, he established, working as a programmer, uh, having a savings of over $100,000, and trying to have a normal life, despite the heavy burden he was carrying day in and day out. Amy goes on to say, I actually did tell him I was sorry. Sorry that things ended so terribly. Sorry that I had to take the measure of getting the restraining order because I just didn't see any other option. She, she acknowledges their relationship ended terribly. It ended with a restraining order, meaning Mr. Pursehouse couldn't contact her, and he didn't for all those years, after it even expired. After this conversation, he went back to take pictures, but he asked if they could speak later, and she told him yes. And you'll remember Hernando Chavez described the second, when Mr. Pursehouse approached Amy while they were seated at their table inside the ex -Biz Awards ceremony. And he described how Mr. Pursehouse came over knelt down next to Amy and whispered in her ear. And then Amy turned to Hernando Chavez and said, I'm going to go talk to Gareth some more. So Amy goes on to explain that towards the end of the award show, I sat with him off to the side again as he cried and shook. He was still crying later in the evening. He was still that emotionally devastated that he still was not able to control his crying and his shaking. He, did, he was able to sit up straight and have more of a conversation, and they were able to clarify some things. But he couldn't stop crying, couldn't stop hyperventilating. And he'd have a moment of clarity and then just start breaking down. He said he wakes up every day and cries on the floor. He says, every day, he wished, he wished I was in his life. Every day, for all those years. And then she goes on to conclude, at the end of this conversation, I told him my friend Hernando was waiting for me, and I asked how he would like to end this conversation. He asked for a hug, and I told him that was not a good idea, and he started to cry. Eventually, he walked away, and then she makes a note of him walking away properly and something about putting his hand up as he walked away. These, these excerpts and Amy Harwick's email to herself have important information in them. In, the, in these clips, we hear about Mr. Pursehouse's regrets, his regrets about his relationship with Amy. But, but he did not have an opportunity to fully articulate himself that day. Why? Because he was in a very emotionally <coughs> disturbed state. He was shaking, he was crying. I'm going to object. As to this is being admitted for other than a limited purpose of the victim's state of mind. Sustain. Without having an opportunity to fully express himself, Mr. Pursehouse reached out to Amy Harwick by text message. Oh, before we get to that, let's talk about Amy Harwick's description of Gareth to her friends. The prosecution made a point in their opening argument earlier today 
of saying this was a tantrum. But Marcy Mendoza made a point to say, no, that's not what Amy said, not a tantrum. She said he went crazy, he was erratic, he broke down. And Sarah Rowland said, Amy said he went a little crazy, he was triggered, he got into the fetal position on the ground, he was crying and reciting text messages. Now we can go on to Garrus messages to Amy Harwick, which are very hard to see. So he starts, I interneted your number. Recognize it now that I see it, if I'm allowed to text. And then there's a series of the letter P, and Mr. Pershouse tries to use humor, because this is an awkward, emotional situation. Yes. We shall all pee. And she responds, oh wow, my text was left open and I'm on a call, sorry. And smiley face. He says, so you're not really into talking about pee now. She says, I'm glad we had a chance to speak last night. It sounds like we both needed to express and hear some things from the other, other person. And he continues to joke, just sometimes P, got it. I'm sometimes Y. And then referring to her text, yeah, I needed it, still do. I slept well, almost an hour at 7 a.m. So he had a sleepless night. And I'm right now listening to a phone conference, literally about organizing psych articles for the rapists. Now, we're going to get to know Mr. Pursehouse's sense of humor. He likes to play wordplay, and if you put the word, the rapists together into one word, it's the word therapists. I'm gonna object as soon as I sign an evidence. That's, that's your take on it, doesn't mean that it means that, but it, it's correct that it means that if you put it together, but go ahead. Thank you. She says, I think it was really good that we were able, oh, wait, let's see. He says, not sure if you're done because you, not sure if you're done because you said, how do we finish this now, last night? But if we can meet again, and she says, I think it was really good that we were able to speak last night. I'm sure there's a lot more that you want to process and say to me. So she acknowledges, she realizes, yes, he didn't have a full opportunity to process everything, you know, being so caught off guard that way and that there were still things he wanted to say to her. But for Amy, that, that's not what she needed, and that's fine. And there's no blame to Amy for her choice or her setting of boundaries. No one can test that was within her right, and that was an appropriate thing for her to do. She says, I think that was a lot for both of us. I hope you were able to hear that, hear me last night, when I said that I was sorry for anything that caused you suffering, and that I forgive you for the things that you did to me. I think right now it's best to have some space, and I don't mean that in a negative way. The past is sad and triggering for both of us. I think we ended our talk last night well. We can be civil from a distance, respect each other, and move forward with our own lives. And Mr. Pursehouse responds, so you're still just gone which is exactly my nightmare, and sadly what I expected. So you're still just gone, which is, I'm sorry. And it feels the same as when I wrote you that long list of what I would miss about you, and heard nothing back, just reaching out into the darkness, trying to stop falling. I wish I could do something more but reaching out to you is a crippling action that I had actually contemplated several times over the past few months, just to say to you the word help. Admitting to you how hurt I am is so embarrassing and painful, which demolishes me even more because it used to be I told you every detail about myself, no matter what. So what he is saying here is that he needs help. He knew it before he saw her. He even thought about reaching out to her 
before he saw her, but he restrained himself. He did not. And he knows that this isn't right, that he shouldn't be in this emotional state. That's why he needs help. And that's why he's embarrassed that it's so painful, that he can't get past this. And it demolishes him to have to acknowledge this to her. He's not manipulating her. He's revealing his darkest secret to her. <coughs> I don't know how busy you are, he says, and it truly scares me so much more than I can possibly convey to say this. But please don't vanish on me. Please, please don't let me go through that again. He's begging her, please don't vanish. He's begging her for a chance to talk to her. And when she doesn't respond, he leaves the voicemail message that we heard at the beginning of my statement. Gareth was consumed by emotions and in a crisis. All of these emotions that we've described are the exact hallmark types of emotions that prevent a person from deliberating. When you look at the definition and the elements of first degree murder. These are the terms Amy and her friends used to describe Gara. Dysregulated, out of control, crying, breathing heavily, hyperventilating, shaking violently, obsessing, panic attacks, couldn't stop crying. I mean, everything that you go through, this shows a man in, a, in an emotional crisis. And then his own words, this is my nightmare. I'm reaching out into the darkness, trying to stop falling. Reaching out is a crippling action, help. He's embarrassed, it's painful, he's demolished, and he's afraid. The intensity of his feelings frightened him. So of course they frightened Amy Harwick, of course. Please don't let me go through that again. Don't just vanish, please call me. Now, the prosecution wants to trivialize all of this. They want to pick it apart and take it out of context in a way to prevent you from using it as it's intended to be used to show Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind, to show why he went to 2086 Mound, and to show that he was not thinking clearly. He was in a genuine emotional crisis. Now those text messages that we looked at, I want to remind you that those text messages did not become available until late 2021. This case was filed in February of 2020. Gareth Pursehouse's phone was immediately taken to that Orange County Regional Computer Forensic Lab to be examined. Amy Harwicks was not. It was simply brought to the LAPD. They couldn't open it because it was past protected. And then, for some reason, the LAPD didn't even bother to go into that phone until after the preliminary hearing in late 2021. So when these charges were filed, when we had the preliminary hearing, we did not have the benefit of Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind I'm evidence. Object. I'm not evidence what they had. Well, the timeline speaks for itself, ladies and gentlemen. I can't remember exactly the word they used, but something to cover up his crime by engaging with Natasha Paulson and Anjali G. But what they don't tell you, and what is obvious if you've paid attention to the evidence, is that Gareth Pursehouse was trying to resume his equilibrium when he reached out to Natasha Paulson and Angela G and was trying to have relationships with them. 
He was trying to resume his normal life, but it was obvious he couldn't because he showed up at her house still suffering under the emotions that he had described to her that he had been suffering since they broke up. So after seeing Amy, Gareth tried to recover his fragile equilibrium, but he was consumed, consumed by his emotions. This was not an attempt for him to cover up a crime. How would that cover up a crime? Texting with somebody over, there's a huge gap in the text between Natasha Paulson and Gareth Purse House. It doesn't even look like an attempt to try to show he was engaged in, in anything other than being at her home with that time gap. There's no attempt to cover up where he was in those text messages. And reaching out to Angela G, Angela G on the day, February 15th, the day he ultimately was arrested, there's nothing unusual about that. He was sad, she said. She said she wanted to comfort him the way he comforted her when she was sad. And he suggested they go to a firing range, something they had never done. He knew she was somebody who was into guns, but for some reason on that day, he suggested they go to the firing range. The prosecution also claims that Gareth Pursehouse was reacting out of anger when he arrived at 2086 Mound, that he had this whole thing planned out, that he went there with the intention to kill Amy Harwick, that he went there with the intention to murder her. But where's the anger in those, in those messages? He's supplicant towards her. He's asking, if I may, he's not aggressive with her. He's not saying he's entitled to anything. He's just telling her how vulnerable he is and how need, needy he is. Something that's difficult for him to do, but he did it. If he was angry at her for being blocked, his text messages being blocked, then why wouldn't that anger have surfaced all those years ago when she got a restraining order against him? I'm going to object based on the court's ruling. As soon as I sign evidence. Oh, oh, oh. If he was so angry at her, wouldn't his anger have surfaced at the time when it was close to their breakup? Why wait all of these years if, that, if anger were his motivation? That doesn't make sense. And anger was not his motivation. If it had been, it would have surfaced before February 14th, 2020. The only anger he showed her at the ex Awards was anger about his perce perception of her hypocrisy. You'll remember that um, there was discussion about why are you here? He kept asking her, why are you here? And Ashley Jameson, or Aspen Jameson, asked, said, you know, from her it seemed that there had been an issue about him, about her, about Amy Harwick, disapproving of the porn industry. And Gareth was making an issue of that when he was asking her why she's here. Because during their relationship, it had become an issue. He was. It was shocking to him to see Amy there, knowing that she had disapproved of the industry. The Amy he knew I'm gonna disapproved. Say, this is not it, it, it does, counsel. Uh, so you can rephrase your, your statement or move on. Thank you. Aspen Jamison said it seemed as though she disapproved of the porn industry. So Gareth Pursehouse's anger towards her about hypocrisy was directed towards that. Why would somebody who disapproved of the industry be at an industry event? This was the last <coughs> place in the world he expected to see her. And that led to him being completely floored, literally floored, when he saw her there. Prosecution has introduced statements that Gareth Pursehouse made to his friends while he was in custody at one of the jail facilities. And I want to go through that with you. First, 
you know, there's, there's a jury instruction that tells you how to evaluate a defendant's statements. And it says it's up to you to decide how much importance to give the statements. And the prosecution is trying to claim that this, these statements to his friends are somehow an admission of guilt. So I want to put them in context so that you can make the determination of how much importance to give these statements. Let's see if this will work. Oh, you, man. How are you? <laughs> Shitty. Um, hey, uh, can you help my brother pack up my house, please? Yeah, that's one of the things we we're going to try to talk to you about and see what we can do to help on the, on the outside. Yeah, please, please do that. And, I mean, that's essentially it. How, how do we know how to get... So the first thing he says to his friends is, can you help my brother? My brother's going to need a lot of help. Can you help him pack up my house? I'm with you, man. How are you? <clears throat> I'm not getting out of here. Uh, I have court tomorrow, for, but just to like postpone my initial trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my brother's gonna need a lot of help to get my stuff out. I got out of I got out on bail for a minute, but then I got brought back right, right back in. So they took every penny I had in savings. So now I'm, I have zero cents and actually put my brother in debt a little bit. So that's really fucked up. And uh, I need Dave to give him the money he owes me. I think Badly. Busy this week. Okay, well at some point I need Dave to pay my brother the money he owes me. Because it, well, it, I can't, I, you know, I'm not working anymore. Um, and... Uh, I mean that's essentially that's essentially it, really. I hear I hear there's a lot of news. Yeah, you were all over the news, pal. But yeah, all over. Is that your hair? I think I see your hair. Yeah, fuck it. Ugh, they put me on the wrong thing, so I'm like leaning over. <laughs> I can't I can't reach up. I saw your arm. Yeah. God, yeah, uh, so my brother's going to need a lot of help, like, just packing up all my house and, uh, and moving into his house in San Diego. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, do you remember what's the number? Do you have it? And throughout the conversation with his friends, and a lot of this was bleeped out so that the number would not become public. But there's continual conversation about repeating the number so that Gareth knew his friends would be able to remember his brother's phone number and reach out and help his brother. I saw. <laughs> Did you really? Did you really? No, no I'm kidding. I'm no, you saw a date. It's a date thing. Yeah, no, I'm in total isolation. So like, I'm in a cell alone all the time. Super fun, and uh, um, yeah. So, so that, uh, that's a, why you had the public defender. How huh? you, you spent all that money to get the bail out for one day? Yeah, for like fifteen hours. Fifteen hours. Yeah, and uh, and yeah. So obviously my work fired me, or there there probably are. I assume I don't know. I, I assume they are, and. Uh, yeah, and my, my brother had to do all of this for our dad dying last summer, and now he has to do it all for me. So this is a lot to, for him to deal with. So any help you guys can do, yeah, super please. Yeah, we can do for sure. So we're learning about Gareth's current predicament, that he's in isolation, that other than his brother, this is the first time he's had anybody else to talk to. He's in isolation, uh, that he lost a lot of money, Hoping, 
you know, I don't know if you, if you can help him find a legal way to do it, because the guy, basically, I was out, right, and then uh, I hadn't paid him yet, and then the guy found out they were going to bring me back into, into court, or back into jail, and so he rushed me to the, he turned off all, he took us to turn off all our phones, saying the media was tracking us, and then took me to the bank, and got, got me to give him the money, and then he dumped me at a, in and out, and said he was going to be back, and then the uh, task force arrested me again. So, yeah, so if it turns out that they he doesn't give me the money back, my brother the money back rather, if you could try and help with the legal part of trying to do that, possibly if that happens, I, you know, anything, please. Um, and yeah, so I'm really needy right now, I just need help <laughs> with all these outside stuff, which sucks. Yeah, we'll, we'll contact your uh, your brother and see what we can do to help for sure. Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, I was really. Is there, can we like give you money for like your uh, whatever? Like, no, I don't. I don't want any of that. Thank you though. I don't. I don't care about that shit. All I all I care about is is my is you know take, help, like, help my brother. And if my brother gets the money back, then he could just use like it's plenty. <laughs> he could just use that. But. You know, I don't know, but I don't want to be like used to using the store kind of a thing here. I don't care. So as you can see, Garrett's primary concern at this point is his helping his brother clean up his mess, the mess that he's created. No, yeah, I was I was uh, hit up a bunch of times already. Trying people were trying to and sell uh, pictures and yeah, Daily Mail and whatever. It was like the restraining order just ended fucking two days ago, and they're like, you could no, like, that's a lie. That is like fifteen years, years ago. <laughs> no, we you know, the, they, the truth came out. I mean, oh okay, they, had, they put him on a, a forty-eight hour. CBS, you know, like 48 hours. Oh, yeah, they called my brother. They wanted me to be on it. When I was out, they called us when we were out. Um, yeah, uh, anything, anything, like, yeah, so like you said, they're trying to sell, buy things, whatever. If, if something like big ticket money wise comes in, then fucking sell it. Just give the money to my brother. Because he's going to be, he's dealing with so much. Like, I don't care. There's no, there's no, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, tr just yeah. That, I mean, that's essentially it. Help, help, please help my brother, and uh, hopefully. He goes on. Yeah, everything comes down to just helping, helping my brother pack up my my world, and and um, get it to his place. Yeah, get to San Diego, and hopefully, and he's trying to buy a house right now, so I'm hoping he can get that money back and he can use that to buy a house. And then if I get out, I can have a room. <laughs> and we can have a bigger house. And then um, here's one of uh, Gareth's jokes and some other interesting information. But that would be good for my brother. Uh, but I, I do have a joke for you. Uh, what's, what's the most feminine candy bar? Huh. Hershey's. <laughs> yeah, you get your sense of humor. You're making the best of it. Then. Hey, do yeah. you get to give you a pen and paper to actually like write stuff no, down there? Inside? Not yet. I'm trying to get a pencil. I have a piece of paper, but I haven't got a pencil yet. Uh, what is it? He's in a position where he has absolute no autonomy, can't even get a pencil, completely relying on people to help him in the most basic ways. And, as, and let me make a comment about the use of humor. If you go sh uh, Fernando Chavez made a comment during his testimony about using humor as a defense mechanism. He explained to all of us that even though he was in shock and grieving while he met with police officers 
after Amy Harwick's death, he still interacted with people, still worked, and still saw clients. And then he explained that humor is a defense mechanism. People will cope with grief and loss and shock in different ways. He said he could feel deep shock and sadness and also be able to do all the things he described. So the use of humor as a defense mechanism does not mean someone is cold and callous. Moving on. that he says he doesn't want to have hope. He's just trying to make it day by day. This is the last clip. also been on suicide watch during his incarceration. So we established during testimony that this, this tape was made about 16, 17 days after Mr. Pursehouse's arrest. 16, 17 days of being in isolation for his chance to be able to speak to some other people. Now, the prosecution has offered some unreliable evidence to you to support their theory that Mr. Pursehouse had always intended to kill Amy Harwick. The prosecution during their opening argument specifically talked to you about Hernando Chavez and his comments about what he heard at the Ex-Biz Awards and Aspen Jamison's comments and compared the two. And as you recall, Aspen Jamison said she heard Mr. Pursehouse say, funny seeing you here when he first came up. And something along the lines of, you fucking ruined my life. Now the use of the word fucking is something, as you can hear from these clips, is something Mr. Pursehouse says. But that doesn't mean he uses it in a way that's hostile or angry. But when, you, when Mr. Chavez indicated that he heard the statement, there's an embellishment. He claims to have heard, when he testified, he claimed to have heard Gareth Pursehouse call Amy Harwick a bitch. Now, when confronted about that, with that, sta about that statement on cross-examination, Hernando Chavez admitted that previously, on February 18th, 2020, when he was interviewed by detectives about what he observed at the Expiz Awards, he told detectives he did not hear Gareth call Amy a bitch. But suddenly, when it comes time to present testimony, it's a new recollection that he has. And these new recollections need to be looked at carefully because there are a way the prosecution can try to put their thumb on the scale by embellishing the facts. And we need to have a fair trial here. And that means the evidence offered by the prosecution needs to be examined critically. You can't just accept something 
someone says because they're saying it under oath, but you have to examine the, all the circumstances and whether they've made prior inconsistent statements and evaluating the veracity of their testimony. Hernando Chavez was one of Amy Horwick's closest friends. And it, I can't fault him for wanting to remember things in a way that helps prosecute the person that he thinks is responsible for her death. I don't think he's a bad person for that. But that doesn't mean we don't critically examine his testimony. So I ask you to disregard that statement because Gareth Pursehouse did not call Amy Horwick Harwick that word. And we have corroboration of that because Amy, Gareth Pursehouse did not call Amy Harwick that word and Amy Harwick did not note it in her email to herself. If he had said that, you would think no, Amy Harwick yeah. would have written it in her email to herself. I'm asking to consider that for other than the state of mind exception. Right, sustained. Another reason to doubt Mr. Chavez's testimony is his recollection of the second conversation <coughs> that occurred at the ex Awards. You'll recall when he testified, he told us that he remembered after Amy and Gareth walked away from their table in the award ceremony, he went out and sat on a chair and watched the entire conversation. But the text messages between he and Amy Harwick showed that is not what happened. This is defense C. During that second conversation, Amy Harwick texts, texts Fernando Chavez and says, I'm around to the right talking, I'm okay. And he sends the hand emojis. And then follows up at 11.39, about 15 minutes later, still talking. If you were sitting there watching them, he wouldn't have to ask. And she says yes. And he responds, okay, I'll be floating around. I'll walk you to your car. So he's off floating around while Amy and Gareth are talking. And then he says, let me know when you're ready. And she says, okay, just a few men, almost done. And then he asks where she is. Are you downstairs or upstairs? Where should I head towards? And then she tells him where to find her. And that's because he was not sitting there watching. His recollection cannot be trusted. Prosecution has also asked you to believe that Amy Harwick could not have fallen over the balcony railing of her own volition because they want you to believe she was strangled to unconsciousness. However, the evidence does not support that interpretation of, the, of what happened. Dr. Luzzi testified what he would expect to happen if someone was strangled to unconsciousness and he made a point of saying he would expect he would suspect that she would lose control of her bowel and bladder. There was no losing control of bowels in this case. There is a, a suspicion that there was urine there. We don't know who that urine belonged to, if it belonged to a person or her cat. But without the bowel movement, we cannot say Amy Harwick was strangled to unconsciousness. And someone can urinate themselves just by being startled and screaming the way Amy Harwick was described to be screaming by Michael Herman. <laughs> Dr.
Dr. Luzzi said it takes 15 to 20 seconds for someone to lose consciousness if they're strangled. Michael Herman says he was downstairs listening to what happened. And during the trial, for the first time, Michael Herman testified that it became eerily silent after he heard choking sounds. All of Michael Herman's prior statements indicated all he heard was Amy Harwick constantly screaming, that there were no moments of quiet. But by trial, his testimony changed, and suddenly there was an eerie silence, which we're supposed to assume meant she was unconscious. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not what happened. Amy Harwick was conscious and screaming the entire time. I want to go through some of the um, prior inconsistent statements of Michael Herman with you. This is from Exhibit 28. At 1.25 a.m., Michael Herman's initial encounter with the first responders, Officer Fisick and his partner, Edney. Screaming? Did you just, just yelling? Just yelling. And then the officer, 
the officers found her out here? Yes. Wait, this, yeah. yeah. Her back, so just get back in. And she was laying there. I couldn't, I mean, at first I thought it was a doll. I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like, And then at 2.09 a.m. silence. She was screaming the whole time. And then at 9.41 a.m. at the LAPD station. Oh, no, for that 7.55 a.m., I'm sorry. Where, how far are you when you can't hear screaming? I don't know. I just heard the noise. I still left the door. I mean, left the door. It was like, just as it was like coming out. I still hear it. You still hear the scream. And when you're, and when you're... And then at the station at 9.41 a.m. Oops. And can you, re can you remember? Do you still hear screaming? I still heard screaming. When I was still hear screaming. Yeah, and we were at the house. You know, I was house. yelling because so when I was leaving, I yelled up there, hey, motherfucker, like really loud because I wanted her to think I was going upstairs so right. maybe he'd like stop and run. You know, that you know that he's not in the house alone or two of them. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And I didn't know it was like, you know, I didn't know there was multiple people. I, you know, I just didn't right. know. And, and um, I just hope that that would like that they would make the person flee. Right. And and besides the <clears throat> besides hearing her screaming, what else did you hear? Well, didn't you you mentioned to me that you heard like oh well, yeah this shuffling shuffling yeah yeah yeah, yeah. from another I mean, person yeah 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 and it sounded like. That's, that wasn't when I was like running out. That was when I was yelling up Amy. That was when like you know it felt like I heard like shuffling. Okay. Did you hear? Because when I ran out, like I just yelled, hey, and then I ran out. So you see Amy and you hear the shuffling. Yeah, yeah. And then you go into the room. You come back out of the room. She's still screaming. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you yell back up again, and then you exit through the back door. Besides the shuffling, her screaming. Do you remember? Did you hear anything else like banging or clanking or no, that was things all falling down? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so detectives ask him point blank, "What else did you hear?" And there's still no mention of choking or moments where she stopped screaming. It's consistent. It's consistent with her being conscious and screaming. The, all, the entire time that he was able to hear things. There was no moments of eerie silence. Amy, Amy Harwick was not strangled to unconsciousness. Another issue that has arisen is during the autopsy, uh, Dr. Luzzi wrote a report documenting the injuries that he found on Amy Harwick. But for the first time, during his testimony at trial, he mentioned a new injury. He testified to nasal fractures, something that he did not include in his report. And he admitted that when he testified. He did not include evidence of nasal, nasal fractures in his report. And he indicated in his testimony that what he was relying on 
to conclude that she had received nasal fractures, nasal fractures that he said were consistent with being punched in the face. He relied on a PowerPoint provided to him by the prosecutors. He did not know, Dr. Luzzi did not know where the images on the PowerPoint came from, and he didn't know if the images were even from this autopsy. Dr. Luzzi admitted he made no findings of nasal fractions, fractures in the autopsy report. So based on questionable evidence, suddenly at the trial, the prosecution tries to introduce evidence of a punch in the face. Now I know when Mr. Avila was going through his opening arguments to you, he didn't mention it. And I don't know if that means they realize something's wrong with that evidence, but I'm gonna the prosecution. I'm going to ask the jury to speculate about what the prosecutor did. I understand. The prosecution will get another opportunity to argue to you, and I will not. This is my only opportunity to speak to you, so I do have to anticipate, try to anticipate what I think they may argue. And they may argue in their rebuttal argument these nasal fracture, fractures, which are completely unreliable evidence in this case and should not be believed by you. The reason the prosecution wants this evidence before you is because they're trying to paint an inaccurate picture of what happened. They're trying to convince you that Amy Harwick was in a debilitated state because she'd been punched in the face and strangled to unconsciousness. Therefore, she could not have gone over that railing of her own volition. But the prosecution's evidence is not convincing. It is not reliable. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution has not proven to you that Amy, Amy Harwick was incapable of climbing over that railing in an effort to escape. Michael Herman testified that he had sciatica, and that was why he didn't run upstairs to help Amy. He was afraid he wasn't in physical condition to be able to be in a fight. But even with his impaired state, he was able to climb a much higher gate, not once, but twice. Exactly the adrenaline, the exact same type of adrenaline that Michael Herman had coursing through his body that got him over that fence, not once, that spiked fence, not once but twice, was the same type of adrenaline Amy Harwick had at her disposal. And it makes sense that if you see somebody you're afraid of, you're going to run for the exit. And Amy Harwick was comfortable being on the railing of that balcony and she had the means and the ability to climb over it. And the prosecution has not proven otherwise. Now the prosecution has brought up the fact that we did not call Bob Malik to testify about the reconstruction. And that really tells me that the prosecution is worried about their case because they know it is their burden of proof. They are the ones who have to present evidence to you, not the defense. We get to rely on the state of the evidence. We get to rely on the prosecution's failure to prove their case to you. And they are the ones who should have hired an accident reconstruction expert to present to you definitively how they feel their interpretation of the evidence in this case is merited by the dynamics of falls and how you calculate falls and accident reconstruction. You saw the prosecution spared no expense in this case. They brought experts in from all over, experts who are very learned, experts who charge a lot of money. They paid over $65,000 to get a 3D sanitized, I call it, sanitized recreation of 2086 mound and 2080 mound, but they did not present you with evidence to tell you how Amy Harwick came to land in the position she was in at the bottom of that balcony. That's on the prosecution. It's their burden to prove it to you, and they have failed to do that.
I just I forgot to also mention one other fallacy, a couple other fallacies about the autopsy and the signs of the beating to the face. If Amy Harwick had been punched in the face and received those nasal fractures, there would have been blood. And there is no blood on the balcony, in the bedroom, in the hallway between the blue room and Amy Harwick's bedroom, anywhere to substantiate a claim that she was punched in the face with such force that she was caused nasal fractures and she was debilitated. All of the blood was where she came to land, which is consistent with injuries from a fall. Also, you saw photographs of Gareth Persaus's hands. Now, the prosecution made a point of telling you that there are no cuts on Gareth Persaus's hands because he was wearing gloves. Now, I dispute and I disagree that they've proven he was wearing gloves inside the house, and we'll talk more about that later. But primarily, what I want you to focus on is the fact that his hands were not bruised. If he is punching somebody with such force to cause nasal fractures, you would see bruising to his hands. And there was no bruising to substantiate that type of assaultive injuries. Gloves would not protect you from those types of bruises. Gloves would not protect your hands from showing signs of hitting somebody with enough force to break their nasal cavity. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it was Amy Harwick who left her DNA on the balcony door. I'm showing you People's Exhibit 93. You'll remember uh, Nick Sanchez, I believe, was the uh, witness who testified about collecting a swab, collecting uh, biological evidence from this area. And we asked him to tell us where it was collected from. Showing you B. And you can't see on this photograph, he said, where it was collected from. But he claimed it was to the right of this little measurement device, this ruler. If Gareth Pursehouse had left Amy Harwick's DNA on this doorknob or on this door in this area, then you would have expected to find it here. This is defense triple A. This is the kitchen door that was left open that the prosecution claims Mr. Pursehouse ran out. And if you look closely, you see that this door it requires a doorknob to be opened and a deadbolt to be opened. Yet no DNA was found on this door. It was Amy Harwick who opened that balcony door and left her DNA. It was Amy Harwick who went out on that balcony on her own volition. It was Amy Harwick who, in an attempt to escape Mr. Pursehouse, in a panicked state, screaming, tried to climb over the balcony to get away. Even if Mr. Pursehouse were wearing gloves, that DNA would have been on that kitchen door if it came from him. If the balcony door was, had DNA from those gloves, those gloves still would have been able to transfer DNA on that kitchen door, but there was no DNA there. And that's because Mr. Pursehouse was not the one who left the DNA, Amy Harwick's DNA, on that balcony door. The prosecution has a theory they're trying to convince you of. 
that this nicotine syringe was intended to be used as a weapon. That it was intended to be used as a weapon by Gareth Pursehouse against Amy Harwick. There are several problems with that theory. First, the prosecution was arguing today that Gareth Pursehouse came to acquire that syringe with nicotine after the XBIZ awards. The evidence does not support that. First, it's completely speculative. But we actually have evidence that indicates that syringe was an old syringe, that nicotine in the syringe was dated and old and had started to de decompensate. If you recall, there was testimony from Dr. Benowitz about nicotine. Dr. Benowitz testified that nicotine is a clear substance. It's clear like water. And as it breaks down, it turns darker shades of brown. Here, this nicotine had turned so brown, it was mistaken to be tar heroin by the officers who responded to 2086 Mound. That's how brown this clear liquid had turned. Dr. Benowitz testified it would take months or years for nicotine to break down outside the body. So okay, this that's nicotine, that's, not an evidence. Right, that's that is Dr. Benowitz's testimony, that it takes months or years to break down outside of the body. So this syringe containing nicotine would take months to years to turn that brown. This indicates that Gareth Purse has had it for a longer period of time, which means he didn't acquire it to use it against Amy Harwick. He acquired it months or years prior to encountering her. I'm going to object to these facts not in evidence. All right, counsel, that's uh, correct. Sustain. This indicates that this syringe was not intended for Amy Harwick. It indicates he did not acquire it after the XBIZ award. The color verifies this the color of this clear liquid had changed over time because it had started to break down. The prosecution also wants you to believe this myth that nicotine is somehow undetectable or too difficult and would have been used to commit the perfect crime. But let's look at the circumstances here. First, whether or not it was even intended to be a weapon. How was Gareth Pursehaus was supposed to be able to inject her. Dr. Benowitz talked about trying to inject somebody intravenously who's resisting and struggling. The prosecution is trying to manufacture some way for Mr. Pursehaus to have restrained her in order to I, apparently inject her with this syringe. And they even are so desperate that they point to the drawstring on his shorts and try to make a claim that it's somehow a piece of rope or string or something that he could have used, which is ludicrous. They also they also this piece of evidence on Ivar Street behind that empty lot where we saw those trash cans lined up. This tangled web of wires somehow might be evidence in this case. theory that he was going to untangle this mass of wires and somehow use it? No, Jim, this takes the arguments made. It's ludicrous. 
This syringe was not to be used on Amy Harwick. It is not an effective weapon unless you have a means of injecting someone intravenously. And even a phlebotomist would have trouble doing that. I know when my daughter was three years old and I had to take her to the doctor for routine immunization, it took three grown adults to restrain her in order to get a shot. Now, I mean, maybe that's not politically correct anymore to admit that you physically restrained your child, but that was the reality. This was not intended to be a weapon. If you look at the syringe, when you are in the jury room, look at the syringe. Look at how long that needle is. The syringe wasn't even completely full. We have to assume that this was brought for some other purpose because it is not a weapon. If Mr. Pursehouse intended to kill Amy Harwick, wouldn't there be a lot of other efficient, meaningful ways to do it other than bringing a syringe? That syringe was intended for somebody else. We know that when Mr. Pursehouse was arrested and he was detained at the Twin Towers facility, he was put on suicide watch. We know that Dr. Benowitz acknowledged that if you do a Google search for nicotine, that you will see literature documenting the use of nicotine for suicide. Objection to the court's order. Dr. Benowitz testified that a Google search for nicotine will reveal scientific literature validating the use of nicotine in suicide. I'm going to object to the side by saying that court's rule. Well, no, I, uh, that court will allow it just for that limited purpose. I think if the doctor did testify to something to that effect, though. So. And Dr. Benowitz also testified that if you want to commit suicide, the most efficient way to do it using nicotine would be an intravenous injection. I'm object that the state's testimony. Does. Okay, sustain. Let's move on, Kim. Dr. Benowitz talked about the way nicotine is metabolized. And he indicated that if someone tries to kill themselves ingesting nic nicotine orally, it is not an effective way because the way the nicotine is metabolized, it has to go through the stomach first. And people get sick and they throw up. And by throwing up, they release the, the poison from that, their body and it's not effective. But Dr. Benowitz acknowledged the most efficient way for the body to metabolize nicotine for a suicide is via an injection. And that, that Using it as a reject, as a, using it via an injection means you need a much smaller dosage. Because if you're going to try to kill yourself using an oral I'm dose. Object, trying to kill yourself. No, it seems like not an evidence. Your Honor, this is part of the evidence. Well, uh, again, if, 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 you kept it, if you kept it in a general sense, which you were doing, and that the most efficient way of doing it would have been by, 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 uh, uh, by, by use of a needle as opposed to taking it orally, you're right, you would have thrown up and so forth. Keep it in that general sense, the court will allow you to do that. Otherwise, I'll sustain the objection. Okay, well, Dr. Benowitz did testify <laughs> that the intravenous injection was the most efficient way of whether it's intravenous, intramuscular, um, or taking nicotine by orally, intravenous is the most efficient way to commit suicide. We'll be taking a break soon, ladies and gentlemen. Also, um, um, how much longer do you have, Council? Just a second. It's hard to say, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead for another five minutes. Well, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a break now. Let's go. Welcome back. An hour and a half flies by when you're having fun, apparently. I'm shocked. Um, I just want to make one last point on the uh, fallacy of this undetectable nicotine. Uh, we had testimony from a criminalist, Philip Nahn, who analyzed 
did a narcotics uh, analyst an did a narcotics analysis of the syringe containing the nicotine. It came back negative for any type of controlled substances. However, it was run through this GCMS machine, which compares unknown samples to a library comparing chemical properties of an unknown substance to the chemical properties of known substances which are preserved in a library. And when the results came out showing that there were no controlled substances, other items were detected. And we're going to look at the big numbers over here. The right, and this is, I'm showing you defense NN. So the second library run shows nicotine with the highest number of 97. And it shows other items as well pyridine, cotinine, which is a metabolite of nicotine. You can hardly say nicotine is an undetectable property when it is so easily discovered by the GCMS, GCMS machine in its analysis when it was only looking for control substances. Now Dr. Wu testified about his analysis of the nicotine. This nicotine was analyzed by a lot of people. Dr. Bradley, first after LAPD, got this library result. You'll remember Guy Holloman, who's the supervisor of Philip Non at the LAPD lab, suggested that the FBI do the confirmation test to determine what, in fact, was in the syringe, since LAPD did not have a standard or a sample by which to compare the nicotine. So they don't do that. So they sent it to the FBI on Guy Holloman's recommendation, and it was confirmed, because that's what it was. So this is not undetectable. Now the prosecution, in their examination of uh, other witnesses, brought up the fact that there are these other substances in there. This, this, I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly. Pyridine, P-H-R-I-D-I-N-E, has a 97. But Dr. Wu explained when he testified, they were only testing for nicotine. And rounding up, they found that the liquid in the syringe contained 87% nicotine. What was the other 13%? Well, it wasn't confirmed because Dr. Wu was only testing for nicotine. But this was not a pure sample. So 13% of the substance inside that nicotine is still unknown to us. But nicotine was detective, and I hope we can lay to rest the fallacy of nicotine being this undetectable substance. The prosecution introduced evidence that Mr. Chris House had on his computer or, or accessed via his computer uh, a device, an external hard drive, that had a file with the name Horphone on it. And the prosecution is trying to get you to believe that the naming of that file is evidence of his hatred and desire to kill Amy Harwick. The problem with that is that the naming of that file was done in 2012 and has nothing to do with Mr. Pursehouse's state of mind in 2020. There was a stipulation, and the second line of the stipulation says, the original path file name, which contains Horphone, was created in 2012. So that naming convention was in 2012 
when Mr. Pursehouse and Amy Harwick split up and he believed she had cheated on him. The prosecution is trying to get you to speculate as to what happened between Amy Harwick and Gareth Pursehouse on the third floor of 2086 Mound. Unfortunately, the prosecution did not obtain the Nest camera audio and video from that evening. And the reason they did not obtain it is because LAPD officers, detectives, who filed a search warrant failed to make a preservation request. And Google only retains Nest video for five days on the type of account Amy Harwick had. You would expect law enforcement in investigating a crime of this magnitude would know that Google does not retain Nest Video indefinitely. And there is an urgency in obtaining this evidence, an urgency and an opportunity to resolve questions that are still outstanding. But the prosecution did not file that preservation request. Even though witnesses, such as Robert Koshlin, told them, hurry up and get that Nest video. So when the prosecution claims that the evidence shows one thing or another, remember, it is their burden of proof. And if the Nest video would have resolved some of these issues, the failure to get that evidence is on the prosecution. And any of ambiguity, ambiguities as a result of the loss of that evidence should result, be resolved in favor of the defense. I'd like to talk to you a bit about some of the jury instructions that you're going to have and you've already been instructed on. And I'm not going to go through them in detail, but just talking first about first degree murder. The prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the killing was first degree murder rather than a lesser crime. And you're going to be asked to consider lesser crimes in this case. If the people have not met this burden, you must find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder, and the murder is second degree murder. Continuing on first degree murder, Deliberation and premeditation. These are the things that the prosecution must prove in order for there to be a finding of first degree murder. The prosecution must prove that the defendant acted willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation. Willfully means he intended to kill. The prosecution has not established that Mr. Pursehouse went to 2086 Mound with the intention to kill <coughs> Amy Harwood. That well, I want to object. That the law. <laughs> Deliberately, that the defendant carefully weighed the considerations for, I'm sorry, that should be and, against his choice, and knowing the consequences, decided to kill. And premeditation, if he decided to kill before completing the acts that caused death. And then we're going to go on to the next one, which talks about deliberation, and premeditation. And this is important because a decision to kill made rashly, impulsively, <coughs> or without careful consideration is not deliberate and premeditated. So if somebody makes a rash decision in the heat of a moment, as opposed to having arrived at that location with the intention to kill, that is insufficient for there to be deliberation and premeditation. Let's talk about first degree murder by means of lying in wait. The defendant needs to conceal his purpose from the person killed, wait and watch for an opportunity to act, and then, from a position of advantage, intend to and did make a surprise attack on the person killed. It is not sufficient to merely show the elements of waiting and watching and concealment. The prosecution must prove that the defendant did those physical acts with the intent 
to take the victim unaware and for the purpose of facilitating an attack. And the prosecution has not shown, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Mr. Pursehouse went to 2086 Mount Street in order to attack or harm Amy Harwick. Provocation for second degree murder. Provocation reduces a murder from first degree to second degree when provocation raises a reasonable doubt about premeditation or deliberation. If you conclude the defendant committed murder but was provoked, consider the provocation in deciding whether the crime was first or second degree murder. And let me say this. Provocation is not defined as some that does not require that the person provoked be provoked in a way which requires them to act in self-defense. The type of provocation we're talking about is any type of provocation that causes someone to get into an emotional state, emotional state that disrupts their ability to premeditate and to deliberate. And going back to the deliberation, deliberation requires that someone carefully weigh the considerations for and against his choice and knowing the consequence decide to kill. So someone who acts under the heat of a moment as opposed to somebody who actually premeditates willfully and deliberately is not first degree murder. Provocation to get to second degree murder. Provocation reduces a murder from first degree to second degree when provocation raises a reasonable doubt about premeditation or deliberation. If you conclude that the defendant committed murder but was provoked, consider the provocation in deciding whether the crime was first or second degree murder. The provocation, again, is an emotional state created by the circumstances surrounding the person's decision making. A killing that would otherwise be murder is reduced to voluntary manslaughter if the defendant killed someone because of a sudden quarrel or heat of passion. Heat of passion can be any violent or intense emotion that causes a person to act without due deliberation and reflection. So violent or intense emotions are exactly the type of emotions that cause someone to be considered provoked for the purpose of second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. Sufficient provocation may occur over a short or long period of time. So in determining whether Gareth Pursehouse was suffering under the type of emotional strain and emotional state of being that predated running into Amy Harwick, you can consider the totality of the years of burden he was carrying, all of the years of emotions he was carrying, and deciding his mental state and finding that there was provocation yeah, in this okay. case. Sustained. Well, sufficient provocation can occur over a short or long period of time, and you're entitled to consider his state of mind as he explained it to Amy Harwick in their text message exchange. Uh, object using the state of mind again as actual evidence of defendant's intent. intent. <clears throat> the prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not kill as the result of a sudden quarrel or in the heat of passion. If the p prosecution has not met this burden, you must find the defendant not guilty of murder. You do not, regarding the lying in wait special circumstance, you do not need to even consider the special circumstance allegation if you find the defendant not guilty of first degree murder and guilty of second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. The lying in wait special circumstance has additional elements. It requires an intentional killing committed while lying in wait. 
And a person commits murder by lying in wait when they conceal their purpose from the person killed, they watch and wait for an opportunity to act, and then with a surprise attack on the person killed, from a position of advantage, they intend to kill the person by taking them by surprise. So this requires that the person committing a surprise attack actually intend to kill the person. Here, we did not have a surprise attack. Here, we did not have the intention by Mr. Pursehouse to harm or kill Amy Harwick. And finally, burglary also requires, in this case, that Mr. Pursehouse entered 2086 Mound with the intent to commit murder. Given that Mr. Pursehouse did not intend to commit first degree murder, the only way you could convict Mr. Pursehouse of burglary is if you find him guilty of second degree murder, if you find him guilty of voluntary manslaughter, the burglary count mm -hmm. cannot be found to be true. Finally, circumstantial evidence. This is important because if you can draw two or more reasonable conclusions from the circumstantial evidence in this case, and one of those reasonable conclusions supports the finding of not guilty or an untrue finding, you must conclude the allegation was not proved by the circumstantial evidence. And I want to talk the last instruction about flight because the prosecution is claiming that Garrett Pursehouse, by running away from 2086 Mound, showed consciousness of guilt. And I want to talk about what flight really means. If Garrett Pursehouse was at Amy Harwick's home with the intention to speak to her and not to harm her, and things went terribly wrong, and she fell to her death, and he never intended to harm her, that would create a situation in which he would have a fight or flight response, a typical physiological reaction to any type of stressful event, which is something we've seen in this case. Michael Herman had this response. He ran. I believe the evidence supports the conclusion that Amy Harwick had this fight or flight response, and she ran for the balcony railing. And Gareth Pursehouse is no different. Having things go sideways and go end up with a terrible result, it's not inconsistent with an innocent state of mind to run in panic. But you also have to consider that actual professionals did not attend to Amy Harwick when they encountered her lying on the pavement. Actual professionals who were trained LAPD officers did not attend to Amy Harwick in a way to try to help with her injuries because the injuries were so severe that no layperson could do anything. And even the paramedics acted very deliberately and cautiously in treating Amy Harwick. So it's unfair for the prosecution to only assume that Mr. Pursehouse's reaction in running from 2086 Mound leads to a finding of consciousness of guilt. Now, if Mr. Pursehouse had planned this, as the prosecution claims, you would expect Mr. Pursehouse to actually flee. This is a man with means to be able to run from detection by police. This is a man with money in the bank. He could have gone to his brother's house in San Diego. He could have crossed the border to Mexico. He could have, flo he could have flown. He could have literally flown away. I'm going to object on this speculation. Uh, I'll allow it. And he did not. Mr. Pursehouse knew there were signs of forced entry at 2086 Mound. Mr. Pursehouse knew he was on the next door neighbor's ring video. Mr. Pursehouse knew he had made a scene at the XBiz Awards that was not going to go undetected if some harm came to Amy Harwick. And what did Mr. Pursehouse do? He stayed home. He didn't leave. He waited. He waited for what he knew was coming, 
the inevitable arrest. He did not flee. Not only that, the prosecution is claiming they found evidence in his home to tie him to what happened at 2086 Mound. They found a syringe, the same type of syringe, in the kitchen. They found gloves, which they say to you today, may be the same gloves. Mr. Pursehouse didn't dispose of this evidence. If Gareth Perthshaw's plan all along was to kill Amy Harwick, wouldn't you expect him to try to evade the authorities instead of staying home, making no attempt to flee, no attempt to escape? He stayed home at the address on his driver's license where he was arrested. On February 14, 2020, Gareth Pursehouse went to 2086 Mount Street because he lost control of his overwhelming emotions. Breaking into 2086 Mount Street was an impulsive decision. He impulsively broke into Amy Harwick's home in the heat of his emotions in a desperate attempt to talk to Amy Harwick. He believed there was only one way forward for him, to talk to her, to get her to release him from his agonizing pain of unresolved grief due to their breakup. He had regrets he needed to share with her. There were things left unsaid at the Expos Awards that he still needed to say. He needed to be heard and understood. His actions were not carefully considered Instead, his actions were the result of rash, impulsive, and erratic thoughts brought to the forefront by his emotional state. Her death was never his goal. Her death would not alleviate his pain. He needed to talk to her. The intensity of his devotion to her was terrifying to him. We agree, Gareth Pursehouse had no business being in her home, but that doesn't mean he is guilty of first degree murder or of lying in wait or the lying in wait special circumstance. What likely happened that night is that when Gareth was in the house, Amy came home, and we don't know what time she came home. We don't know what time she arrived at 2086 Mound, and we don't know what time she walked in. All we know is she got a text message about 102, 101 AM. But we don't know where she was exactly when she got that message. We do know her phone was on her bed. We don't know where in her house Gareth Purse house was at that time when she was on the third floor. We don't know if he was downstairs and came up the main stairwell to the third floor. We don't know if he was already on the third floor. Nest camera video would have been helpful to make that determination, but we don't have that. Michael Herman testified that he awoke to the sound of Amy screaming, and at first he thought it was a mouse. The screaming didn't stop, so he started to wonder something was wrong. He said the only time, other time he'd heard someone scream like that is when somebody had seen a mouse. So he shouts up, he screams out, as loud as he can, Amy. And then he says things change. Before, her screams were staying in one place. She wasn't being jostled. There was no movement. But after he heard Amy, then he started hearing the shuffling he described. He heard two bodies go to the ground. We don't know who initiated the physical confrontation. You might assume that because Gareth Pursehouse was the larger person, he did it, but we can't make assumptions when it's the prosecution's burden to prove this case beyond all reasonable doubt. It is just as likely, if not likelier, that after Amy had spoken to Michael Herman about this person, about increasing security in her home, 
and making Michael Herman aware that this person might be somebody that sh to be concerned about, that they came up, that it was in her mind at least, that Michael Herman, by shouting up Amy, was on his way to come render her assistance. And she preemptively attacked Gareth Burshouse in order to subdue him because she was afraid of him. Without an opportunity to know why he came, she preemptively attacked him. A struggle resulted from this interaction. We don't know how it began exactly, but we do know that she was screaming for quite some time, minutes, Michael Herman said, while he fumbled around before he screamed up Amy. And if Gareth Pursehouse had intended to attack Amy Harwick, why wait while she screamed? Why not attack her immediately? And the answer to that is because he didn't intend to attack her. Her screams, her fear, it's an understandable response. But that does not mean Gareth Pursehouse had any intention to harm her. In his voicemail, in the texts they exchange, even in their conversation at the Exbiz Awards, Gareth Pursehouse made no threats of physical violence against Amy Harwick. The fact is that he was triggered by this series of events triggered to the point where he felt he had no choice but to go to 2086 Mount Street to show Amy Harwick in the most dramatic fashion he could. His pain was real and convinced her he needed to speak to her. The evidence unequivocally shows that Gareth Pursehouse was a man in crisis. He was struggling. He was struggling to deal with the emotional fallout he was grappling with in the years after his breakup with Amy Harwick. And when he saw her at the Expos Awards, that dam he had built to try to repress all of his pain and all of his emotions, that dam burst and the floodwaters were released and he could no longer control the tsunami of his emotions. Prosecution has not proven that Gareth Pursehouse went there to kill or harm Amy Harwick. The prosecution has not proven he deliberately caused her to fall over the balcony railing. Prosecution has not disproven that Gareth Pursehouse was acting due to his emotional provocation, nor have they disproven he acted in the heat of passion. For these reasons, we ask you to return a just and proper verdict in this case. We ask you to find Gareth Pursehouse not guilty of first degree murder and not guilty of the lying in wait special circumstance. Thank you. Thank you.